Hey Forefront, my name is Emmy. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, some of you I have definitely already met, some of you I have not. And I'm sorry that I am now virtually meeting you. I hope that uh, we meet in person at some point. Um, and I'm sorry that after this year of screens, you're forced to reckon with yet another screen. Um, but unfortunately, I am not actually in New York right now. Um, for the past 10 weeks, I've been doing work with Annunciation House, which is a really awesome organization that exists on the border between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez at our southern border, uh, and does work hosting migrants uh, that have recently crossed the border and helping them make travel plans as they get to their next destination in the United States. Uh, if you want to find out any more info about them, they're like the biggest organization that's doing the work they're doing <laughs> in the US. Um, so you can just Google Annunciation House and it'll come up. Um, there's also a really great organization called Las Americas that does legal aid for folks at the border. So if you have like an extra million dollars sitting around and you want to give to either of those organizations, there's my plug. Um, but in terms of uh, at forefront and not <laughs> down here at the border, um, I have uh, been leading uh, the Biblet group with Sammy Main for the last uh, year or so. I helped out with Queer Communion for a bit. You might have seen me doing worship stuff at some point. I also, very briefly in 2019, I think got an award for longest commute to forefront as I was coming from a 159th in Manhattan all the way down to a uh, forefront, which was like a solid 90 minutes <laughs> every every Sunday morning. Um, so there's that as well as part of my forefront resume. Um, and yeah, that's what I've got. Um, I do want to put a disclaimer into today's message that there's a lot of trauma in this message that we're talking about today. There's a lot of violence. Um, we're going to be talking about rape a decent amount. And if any of those things sound like they're triggering to you or sound like there's something that your body just doesn't want to handle today, then please close this tab. Leave the roulette and go get a coffee. Don't feel like you need to stick around. Be gentle with yourself and please go and get what you need. And even if you're in the roulette and you want to take this time to like Maybe switch to a chair that's closer to the door so you can make a sneaky exit if it gets too much. Go for it. Um, please, please, please be gentle with yourself. Some of the stuff we're going to be talking about is biblical. Some of it is more current. So if either of those categories of things sounds like something you just don't want to handle today, please don't make yourself. Uh, and while those folks are shuffling around or closing this tab or getting their coffee, uh, for the rest of us, I want to launch into a quick prayer. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for all of these people that are in the roulette, that are watching this Sunday or some other day. I pray that you would give us some of your much needed love as we're listening to this. I pray that you would make our hearts open to what you want to put in there. And that we would leave this place or this message, if we're watching online, with a better understanding of how to love those around us and how to love ourselves well. Amen. All right, uh, so today's message is going to be on Sodom and Gomorrah, which you may have heard before, you may have not heard before. It's kind of a super intense and pretty bonkers story. Uh, you may have seen pictures before that look like this or that look like this. Because some people are really into the Sodom and Gomorrah story. Some people absolutely love it. Um, the Bible miniseries, which adapts like all of the Bible in more or less historical <laughs> fashion, uh, has like this 10 minute sequence of just like 
fire and brimstone. It's all very intense. It looks a lot like a like a low budget version of like the last 10 minutes of the Lord of the Rings. It's just just fire everywhere. Lots of brimstone and lava and and all of that. Uh, but I don't think that the fire and the brimstone of this message is the most interesting part of this message, let alone the most important part of this message. I just don't think that it's what we're meant to focus on here. Um, so today, as we're talking through, I want to do two things. The first thing that I want to do is look at some of the messy parts of the story. I want to wade through the mess. I want us to talk through the parts of this story that are just gross <laughs> and hard to handle and hard to hard to process. And I want us to wade through that mess together. You might agree with some of my conclusions. You might not agree with some of my conclusions. Totally up to you. But I want us to do that work, that work of waiting. Then I want us to consider what comes next. What happens when we are faced with our own modern day Sodoms? How do we do the work of confronting systemic evil? And what does that even look like? That's such a big prospect. How do we even start to tackle that? So that's the second thing that I want to do as we go through this story. Uh, so that being said, Genesis 19. If you have a Bible and want to flip to it, awesome. If you have a phone and you want to tap to it, also awesome. It'll also be up. I'm not sure where, <laughs> where I'll put it, but it'll either be up over there or on the screen in front of me. Uh, so you can read it there as well. Um, so... Just to orient us a little bit, we are in Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, written 1000 BCE, mas o menos, depending on who you ask. Um, we've made it past creation. We've made it past the Tower of Babel, past the flood, past all of those kind of like coloring book stories. And now we've landed at Abraham, who is the patriarch of all of Israel. He's the guy that um, you may have learned songs about it at some point about how he's going to make a great nation and his kids will number the stars and all that. That's Abraham. He's the big covenant guy. So if you ever hear a Bible story about covenants, it's probably about Abraham. The odds are high. So Genesis 18, Abraham and God are chatting about covenant things um, and about whether Abraham's wife is going to have a baby. It's all over the place. It's a wild conversation. And then in the middle of this conversation, apropos of nothing, God says this. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Which is super ominous for God to just plop this on Abraham out of nowhere. Like Abraham, they're talking about like if Sarah's going to have a baby and then all of a sudden this comes out. So this is a very ominous note that we take into the next chapter with us. So God follows through on his word. He sends two angels down to Sodom. So the angels show up at Sodom and then Lot, who's Abraham's cousin, is chilling at the city gate there to welcome the angels. And the angels are like, no, we don't need a welcome. We're going to sleep at the square. And Lot's like, nah, you're going to come. You're going to sleep with me. I'm going to make you bread. It's going to be great. The angels are like, okay, cool. That sounds fine too. And this is where things start to get super weird. So bear with me. Here we go. All right. So Lot prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you would like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness so that they could not find the door. Mm. Oh man. Oh, there is so much to unpack here and we do not have time to unpack all of it, but there are a couple things that we got to address if we want to touch on this story at all. And the first thing for me is Lot's actions. 
Lot's actions in saying to this mob of men, you can't have my guests, but you can have my daughters. Whew. And I feel like um, our Western brains, or at the very least my Western brain, up until this point, have kind of seen Lot as the hero of this little story. He was at the gates of the city, he welcomed the angels who have got to be good guys and given them bread and food and now he's doing this. And I feel like for my brain it is very very easy to make the jump that if Lot is our protagonist and our protagonist has God's approval, then this action of offering his daughters up to be raped feels syndicated by God. But I do not think that that is what is happening here. I think that our urge to say, yes, Lot is a protagonist, the men outside the door is antagonists, is just not correct. The Bible does not have clear protagonists and antagonists. You can look at any other Old Testament story and you're going to find that to be true. And I do not think that these words are an any way approved by God, that these actions are perceived as God as anything other than abhorrent and horrific and violent and wrong. I think that that is how God sees Lot's words, as cowardly and as shameful. And I do not think that their inclusion is a sign of God's approval of Lot's action. I don't think that it is telling us anything about God's character other than to reinforce the fact that Lot still gets saved after this is a sign of the enormity of the mercy of this God and the enormity of the love of this God. So, wanted to cover that first. The second bonkers thing that we gotta talk about is this mob of men that shows up at Lot's door to rape his house guests? And a lot of times this story gets kind of retold as like an anti-gay narrative. It's literally where we get the word sodomite from starting in Latin in the 14th century is this story. For centuries, folks have used this story as one of the texts to say, look, these guys were gay. They're clearly evil. All gays are evil. God hates all gays. I'm oversimplifying it. Clearly, that's not <laughs> the extent of everyone's belief. However, I think that if you want to say that this story is a story that is about homosexuality or that is anti-homosexual, you got to look at what's happening in the text. The angels don't show up to the city and see two men holding hands. They don't show up to the city and stumble upon a pride parade. That's not what's happening here. This is a mob of angry men banging on a door in the middle of the night and asking to rape someone's house guests. Also, I don't mean to be crude about this, but if all that they are in it for is sex, you would think that this angry mob of jacked up men standing on the streets together, young and old, in the middle of the night, would be able to figure something out amongst themselves. These men are not in it for sex. They are not here for an act of passion. They are here for an act of violence. They're not banging on this door because they're gay. They're not banging on this door even because they want sex. Lot offers them his daughters and they spit in his face. They bang on this door because they are interested in the humiliation and the domination of these two men that have just arrived into town. And when Lot refuses them, they become invested in his humiliation, his domination. They call him foreigner. They threaten him with violence. In the Jewish tradition, the men of Sodom also get a word, but it's not Sodomite. It's Midat Saddam. And it's not the sin of being gay or of sexual violence. It's the sin of inhospitality. The word Midat Saddam actually shows up in the Talmud in the fourth century, 10 centuries before the word Sodomite ever enters the scene. And when it shows up in the Talmud, it's actually associated with a very specific phrase. And that phrase is, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. I feel like what that phrase articulates is so much bigger than inhospitality. That is a phrase that is about greed. That is a phrase that is about the refusal to see the value of other human beings 
are to address them with dignity. The greed of the sodomites in wanting to dominate and humiliate Lot's guests and refusing to offer them welcome or hope or safety, the greed of prioritizing their own pleasure and their own dominance over the physical safety of others and their willingness to engage in violence to satiate their lust for power. And it's easy for us, or at least it's easy for me, to look in this and be like, yep, you're right, that's terrible and sinful, and I have never engaged in sexual violence. I've never banged on someone's door in the dead of night to ask to do anything to their house guests. This is not something that has anything to do with me. But how many times have I, in interacting with someone in my day-to-day -day life, thought to myself, well, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. How many times have I refused something to a guest or to a friend because I was too invested and too busy in my own pleasure and dominance to think of their needs, their wants, or their desires? How many times have I failed to make someone welcome because I was too preoccupied with what would make me feel best? How many times have you? And I don't ask us these questions to make us feel shame or to somehow imply that boundaries are not important for healthy emotional relationships, but I ask us these questions because I think the text is asking us to consider them, asking us to consider the ways that we are unwilling to let go of our own pleasures for the love of others. Let go of our own comfort and be better hosts to those in our lives that we could welcome into our communities or our homes or our lives. So this next section, the two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, sons-in-laws, sons or daughters or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so strong that he has sent us to destroy it. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. He overthrew their cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. I love this image so much of this pillar of salt because it's so textural and it's so specific. Nothing can grow on a pillar of salt. A pillar of salt is completely devoid of life. In Hebrew traditions, there are a few different understanding of why on earth Lot's wife would look back. One of them is that she was looking to try to see her two daughters that she had left behind. The other one is that she was thinking about going back to get all her stuff to you know, run back to her house and save what she could out of the flames and then head back up to the mountains with Lot. But the third one, and that's the one that I wanna look at today, is that she was turned into a pillar for looking back because she wanted to see the pain and the violence of what was happening from the safety of the mountain. I want us to pause on Sodom real quick and talk about Suidad Juarez. Suidad Juarez, for those of you who have not heard of it or do not know about it, it's right on the border between El Paso and Mexico. It's literally, you can walk to it. Under the Trump administration's MPP, or Migrant Protection Protocol, which did not protect migrants, 65,000 migrants would go there to wait for their asylum hearing. As of May, over 15,000 are still there. If you are white, Juarez is great. I went to a cafe in Juarez and got a cactus salad. When you walk over, there is a shaded walkway for you as you cross over the barbed wire fence and the wall um, that separates the two countries. And once you get there, you're greeted by an outdoor market that sells goods. I walked there alone and not a single person bothered me. If you are white and you are in Juarez, you are probably gonna be just fine. If you are a Central American migrant in Juarez, you are probably not going to be fine. 
Yesterday was the 4th of July in Juarez. Two people were murdered. One of them was found wrapped in a blanket. 18 people have been murdered this month. Last year, five days went by in the entire year where someone was not murdered. Migrants wait for their asylum hearings in Juarez for years. Some people survive the wait, other people do not. In May, a 19-year-old boy named Christian San Martin Estrada was killed a few days before his hearing for asylum into the United States. To hear of Juarez and remain silent is to be a pillar of salt. To hear of violations of human dignity and not cry out is to become a pillar of salt. And to say to a guest or to a migrant, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours, is to be a sodomite. This doesn't mean that we need to live our lives constantly tuned to the flow of evil in this world because that is not sustainable. It doesn't mean that joy in the face of suffering is sin. And it doesn't mean that taking care of your mind and your body and your soul is anything other than a holy and a worthy practice. But what this does mean is that when we see injustice or violence or death, are we raising an outcry unto the Lord? Not everybody Sodom needs to be Juarez. There is so much evil in this world, in this city, on the subway, on Twitter, in your own home. There is evil literally everywhere. But when we encounter evil, do we turn towards greed and dominance and the pursuit of our own pleasure like the sodomites? Do we turn towards apathy and observation like Lot's wife? Or do we turn towards a third path, orienting ourselves towards the remedy of evil? I want to propose a way forward for us, a way of engaging without indulging the greed of Midet Saddam or becoming voyeurs to the suffering of this world. I want to propose a third path that does not involve overindulgence or underattentiveness, but engages us to the practice of the restoration of this world. And I want to do that by considering three C's. The first C is to choose to see, not as voyeurs or as people standing by, but with our eyes wide open, abandoning blindness and choosing to live as engaged members of this world. We choose to see the violence of our cities, the racism of our government, the corruption of our histories. We choose to hold that. It doesn't mean that we're listening to NPR 24-7. It doesn't mean that we don't have healthy boundaries and practices to restore us so that we remain healthy and whole and well. Even Jesus would go up to the mountain and he would take his naps and then he would come back. Choosing to see means being aware of the suffering of this world, choosing to acknowledge it and yet choosing to orient towards hope anyways. The next thing I want to talk about is choosing to listen. Twice in the story, the phrase come up, the outcry against them was so strong. And the first time I read the story, my question was, who is doing the outcrying? The angels haven't showed up in Sodom yet. Where is this noise coming from that is so loud and so holy that the God of the universe is hearing it? I think it is everyone who passed through that city and did not have angels to defend them. I think it is everyone who was emotionally and physically destroyed by the greed and the violence of that place. I think it is every child who, like Lot's children, was offered up to a stranger but did not have a chance to escape. The outcry of the oppressed will always, always fall on God's ears. God will always hear them. We have to choose to open ours.
We have to choose to listen, not just to the voices that make us comfortable or that we are used to or that hold power, but to those who have been destroyed by the city. Those who have been crushed by systems that we may have never considered. Those who are crushed by our tiny apathies, our tiny acts of dominance in the selfishness that we engage in in our everyday lives. Who in your life can you choose to serve as a listener? The third C is to choose to speak. Choosing to speak does not necessarily mean choosing to add more words to the mix. It does not mean going on to Twitter. It does not mean yelling at a relative. That is not what I'm talking about. The meaningful addition of our voices does not necessarily mean the articulation of our own thoughts and opinions. The meaningful addition of our voices is the voice of our lives, the voice of our actions, the voice of the daily practices that we engage in that reinforce the hope and the bringing of restoration. It means that we are creating a practice of living where our daily lives speak to the suffering of the world in a determined voice that refuses to resign itself to injustice. It's choosing to speak with your life that what's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. And we can hold this mess together. Thanks, Barfrette.